Testament. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13. We're going to look this morning at Exodus chapter 13. We're going to walk um, uh, through a couple of chapters as we've been doing. And, and I want to, I wanna bef- as you're turning your Bibles there, I want to just pause for a second and ask you to clear your mind. And as you clear your mind, I want to see if I can pick your mind, pick your brain rather for a second. Um, I want you to think back to November of 2019. And I want you to think back to what you were doing in November of 2019, the, the, you know, the, the, the plans that you were making as you were thinking about venturing off into the upcoming year. Um, and as you think about that, I want to ask you a question. Did any of that, any of that planning include where you are today? How much of that planning included where you are today? I would guess that there was probably a lot of plans that you had for where you would be in November 2020. And a lot of those plans probably didn't get accomplished this year. Now, I'm just spitballing, but I would be willing to bet that a lot of the things that you had set aside as goals, as, as, as things that you had planned on accomplishing, have somehow, some way been derailed. And in particular, the one way that it has been derailed the most is what we are all collectively facing together, which is this pandemic. Is anybody out there, can anybody attest to that, or, or is everybody pretty much on, on schedule, everything's going fine, there's been no disruptions for you in your life. Okay, all right. No show of hands to say no disruptions, so I'm assuming that everybody has been disrupted in some way. And this is, in some ways, this is life. Of course, this is, we, we don't have a pandemic every year, but life is about disruption. Life is about things, you know, us having in mind a charted course and then that charted course being disrupted and our route being, or our route being changed and transformed and altered. And and, and what I want to talk to you this morning, what what I want to talk to you about this morning is a, a course that is disrupted, but it is disrupted with purpose as God often does. He doesn't disrupt just for the sake of disruption. He disrupts with intention, he, intentionality and with purpose in mind. And so in, and, and as you look in, 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 these, in, in these chapters, what you're going to see is this altered course. And, and this altered course has, has very clear intention, all right? This altered course, for example, when you look at chapter 13, verse 17, you see that this altered course demonstrates God's faithfulness. Verse 17, it says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although although that was near. For God said, Lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of wilderness toward the Red Sea, and the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. This has happened right after the great Passover event that has, that has stricken all the firstborn in Egypt dead. And Pharaoh has basically begged and pleaded Mo for Moses to take Israel out of his community, out of his nation, out of his country. And the route through the land of the Philistines was actually the quickest route to get to their promised destination. And yet, it was not the route ordained by God. God gives Moses the reason for not ordaining this route. He says, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Simply put, they weren't ready to fight. They left dressed for battle. They left in a a formation for battle, a marching formation, but they weren't actually ready for battle. They were were 
in appearance possibly ready for battle, but internally and spiritually they certainly were not ready for battle. And had they went that route, they would have swiftly returned to Egypt, God said. And so God gives them an alternate course, not because it was the quickest course, but because it was the best course and the right course. And this example applies to all of the Christian life. God's route is not always the quickest route because God's goal is not getting you to the destination quickly. God's goal is often, or God's goal is his glory and your sanctification. Now, you know, many of us complain about the time um, that God often takes to put us somewhere, right? Right? The time that he takes to promote us on a position or pr promote us to a new position on the job. The, the time that he takes to make a change in our relationship status in our life. The time that he takes to open up a door um, in, in a ministry that we believe God has possibly called us to. But oftentimes, God uses the distance between where we are and where he desires us to be to, 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 to ready us for when we arrive to that actual place. How many times have you been upset that you didn't get somewhere sooner, only to realize when you finally get there that you would have messed it up if you got there sooner? Anybody, anybody out here feel, ever felt that way? That when you, when you finally get to that place, you realize, I had no business being at this place any earlier than, where I, than, than when I am now. Because had I got here earlier, somebody would have been hurt, namely, most likely me. God's alternate route prepares us. God's alternate route protects us. God's alternate route obviously provides for us. It's not always, again, the easier route, but it doesn't need to be the easier route. The one who travels with us knows every obstacle in front of us. And not only does he, not only does he know the obstacle, but he knows how to navigate the obstacle. But not only does he know the obstacle, and not only does he know how to navigate the obstacle, but he knows he, or rather, he has the power to move the obstacle. Don't forget his promises to us in Romans chapter 8 where he says, For those that love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purposes. God is working in the alternate routes in our lives to receive glory and to confirm us more and more into the image of his son. Even in the alternate routes, God remains faithful, but he is not only faithful in the sense that he directs us down the alternate routes, but he is faithful in the sense of leading us through the alternate routes. We see this on hand in verse 21. It says, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud, in a, in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. God provided Israel his constant presence to lead them as they traveled down this alternate route. A literal cloud in the sky that became a pillar of fire at night. Whether in the night or in the day, God provided guidance to his people. He did not depart from them as he navigated them through an alternate route. But for Christians here today, for, for all the Christians that are out here today, have you ever read passages like these and you said to yourself, man, I wish the Lord would, would do something like that in my life. I wish he would provide me the constant guidance that I need. I wish he would give me a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire to direct me along the way. But can I encourage you and enlighten you this morning? God has already provided that to you. God has already given that to you. And his name is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in the book of John that these things I have spoken to you, this is Jesus speaking while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. It goes on to say in the 16th chapter of John that when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak 
on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The spirit of the living God is not a cloud outside of us leading us. The spirit of the living God is a person indwelling in us to lead us and to guide us in accordance to the will of God. How often do you make that appeal to the Lord, saints? Lord, guide me by your spirit. Lead me by your spirit. Direct me by your spirit. Order my steps by your spirit. One of the chief evidences of God's faithfulness to us in the alternate routes of life, the routes that often appear off course, the routes that feel too hard to travel, one of the chief evidences is the Spirit of God on those alternate routes. When we travel the hard roads, we can trust that we are never traveling those roads alone. In the words of King David, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Speaking of the shadow of death, here's another insight into alternate routes that God sends us on. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, we see that God desires glory on these alternate routes, which is part of the reason why he takes them there, takes us on them. Verse 1, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of, in front of Piahirath, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Notice that God not only sends them down an alternate route, he literally turns them around and sends them backwards. The move is definitely precarious. The move is definitely suspect to the human eye. That God says, Pharaoh is going to see you. So, so suspect that God says, Pharaoh is going to see you coming back. And he's going to think that you came back because you had no other choice. You had to come back. Let me share something with you. If you've ever tried to discern God's will for your life by asking yourself, what's the easiest path? Then you are doing it wrong. God's will for your life is not always the easiest path. God's will for your life is not always the path with no, uh, with no obstruction. Over and over again, we see God's will leading us to the banks of troubled waters. Is it always hard? Of course not. Or rather, if it, is it always easy? Of course not. However, if it's always easy, then you can rest assured that it is sometimes your will and not God's will. Is it always hard? Of course not. But you can rest assured if it is always easy, then it is most likely your will and not God's will. Abraham and Sarah were given the hard path when the Lord established a covenant with Abraham at 75, telling him that he would be the father of many nations. And then gave him Isaac at 100 years old. So at an old age, he established a covenant, and then Abraham had to wait another 25 years before he saw the fruition of it. Joseph was given the hard path when he was sold into slavery as a young man by his own kin. And when he was falsely incarcerated and thrown into prison as a result of the bitter rejection felt by a powerful woman. But yet, he trusted God through it all, even down the hard path. Daniel was given the hard path when he ceased, uh, or when, rather when he refused to join the masses and, and making an idol out of a political figure. But yet, he trusted God all the way through the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and, and, and Abednego were given the hard path when they refused to bow their knee to the king. In worship, but yet trusted the Lord God all the way through the furnace. 
The prophets were given the hard paths. The apostles were given the hard paths. All of these saints had to take a hard road of obedience en route to seeing God work in powerful and marvelous ways for them. Why should we ever consider ourselves to be exempt? Sometimes God sends us to the hard places, down the hard paths, on purpose. Sometimes the hard decision comes on purpose. Sometimes the hard actions come on purpose. Sometimes the hard work comes on purpose. And why would he do that? Verse 4 of chapter 14. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and that he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. God will sometimes send us down the alternate route in order to receive glory for leading us through the alternate route. God will send us down a road that we can travel through, but we can't travel through it alone. The obstacles will be too plenty, the road too narrow, our strength too feeble. And he'll do that in order to receive the glory for getting us to our destination. See, oftentimes we want to make the, we, we, we want the easy path, but sometimes the easy path also makes it easier for us or for those watching us to believe that we got to the other side in our own power. So God sends us along the alternate route, the route that leads us right through opposition in order that we may not lose sight of who it is that is ultimately bringing us to the other side. Even in your own story of salvation, the requirements of our salvation are orchestrated in such a way where there is little doubt left that we can save ourselves. The more we understand it, the more we know that apart from Christ, it would never happen. The more we understand it, the more we understand the work of salvation, the more we realize just how much grace is required of us to save wretches or required for us to save wretches like us. God is holy. We are not. God requires perfection. We are unable to give it. God is deserving of the highest allegiance, and we fail daily in showing that. It is a hard road, but instead of leaving us to wander it alone, destined for certain failure, he sends his son to us. He sends Christ Jesus to us. He sends him to die for us, taking our place and carrying us across the path of salvation that we were unable to walk on our own in order that we might be delivered from an eternal hell. And that in doing so, he might receive all the glory. He does a similar thing here with Moses in Israel as he turns them back towards Pharaoh in Egypt. Verse 5, it says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots. And all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over, uh, over all of them. Now, don't miss what's happening here in this, in this verse, in verse 5, in v- verse 5 through 7. Don't miss the regret, the reason for the regret, re- regret of Israel's departure here. We can't let Israel leave because if they leave, we lose all of that free labor. You see, saints, you need to understand that there's an important lesson for us here, and and it is this. Injustice is often fueled by a crave for comfort. When we think about the negatives of comfort, we sometimes think of the negatives of comfort simply being that comfort can be an obstruction to grow. If I get too comfortable, then I won't grow. And that is true, but comfort is even more dangerous than that at times. See, it doesn't just simply impact us. Comfort can impact those around us. 
our comfort can not only be an obstacle impeding our growth, it can be an obst obstacle impeding our compassion towards others. The biggest test that we sometimes face in showing compassion comes when our comfort is threatened. Think about it. There are obviously many historical examples of, of injustice, bondage, and captivity, where it was not just a result of sheer cruelty, but it was cruelty that gave the oppressor an economic advantage. It was cruelty for the sake of comfort. You see, if we, are, if, we, if we aren't careful, saints, we can let that sort of cruelty creep into our understanding of how we care for the homeless, how we care for the refugee, how we care for the unborn. You see, that kind of cruelty, maybe it shows up when you're silent around your friends about the injustice of babies being taken from the womb of mothers because you don't want to offend those who vote one way. But see, maybe it also shows up when you're silent about the thousands of immigrant children who were taken from their parents without an effective plan to return them. And the hundreds who still haven't been reunited because you don't want to offend those who vote another way. See, our comfort will silence us from speaking to our groups. And we'll just convince ourselves instead that it's best to keep silent. Because at least our group isn't as bad as the other. We'll convince ourselves that it's best to just keep silent. Why? Because silence is comfortable for us. You see, if we are careful, that crave for comfort will cause us to pass by the wounded man providentially lying on the side of the roads that the Lord leads us down. And by the way, if you haven't noticed it yet, part of the reason, not the only reason, but part of the reason that America struggles so mightily with conversations around compassion and justice is because generally speaking, we love our comfort more than we love anything else. Don't let your comfort rob you of compassion. So Pharaoh, for, out of crave for comfort, says we can't let them go. They have to serve us. Let's go and let's get them back. He gathers his army, gathers his horses and his chariots. And with all of their military training and artillery, they head off and they go and they, get, and they try to get their servants back. Now, if this was a Hollywood blockbuster, this would be the moment where, where, where the montage would begin, the rapid-fire clips would start, and it would be one clip on one side. It would be a clip of bad guys. They're preparing. They're loading their guns. And then on the other side, it would be a clip of good guys that would be training and doing push-ups and loading their guns. And as these clips are going back and forth, bad guy, good guy, clip, uh, gun clip, 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 bang. You know, everybody's practicing, everybody's getting ready. And then you got some hype music playing in the background like Eminem's One Shot or something. You know, a good, a good, a good song with, with, a, with, a, with a hype guitar riff and a hype drum beat. You know, something that's going to really get you excited. This is, the, this is the moment, right? All leading up to the grand finale, the great confrontation where they go after each other, but this isn't how this goes. Again, Israel is taking a longer route, and now they are starting to regret that Moses led them this way. Verse 10, it says in chapter 14, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. With Egypt bearing down on them, what does Israel do? They waver. They start to doubt. Verse 11 says, they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. You know, one of the most interesting observations 
about human life in general, including obviously Israel here in this text. And you see it over and over again in the book of Exodus, by the way, is how physical freedom doesn't necessarily always mean actual freedom. You see, their bodies were with Moses, unchained and en route to a great victory, but their minds and their hearts were still back in Egypt. God recently had turned the Nile into blood. He had brought, he had brought hordes of frogs and locusts and gnats and flies to the land. He had he had brought pestilence and sickness to their enemies, even striking dead the firstborn, and they still suffered from the illness of bondage. You see, they had eaten from the table of bondage for so long that they despised the delicacy of freedom. The chains are gone, but bondage is still present. You see, all of us at some point in time, by the way, don't, don't ridicule Israel too much, because all of us at some point in time in our lives are Israel. God is offering us eternal freedom, deliverance, miraculous salvation, new birth. And yet, as life gets harder, the doubts creep in, and we say, no, God, I'm good. The taste of bondage is, is disgusting, but it is all I know. Some of us even right now may be still turning back to Egypt, even though God is calling us to come and to follow him. Even through the hardship, he is calling us to stop taking our path and turn towards freedom. Turn towards Jesus. Thank God that God pursues us, though. Praise God that God comes after us. Praise God, he doesn't leave us in our, in our miserable state, but he leaves the 99 sheep in order to pursue the one who continues to try to run back to Egypt. Listen to Moses as he encourages Israel, and, and may this also encourage you, and I pray it encourages me even as I read it, verse 14 or verse 13. He says, and Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which, we, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Here's what Moses knows in this moment, saints that Israel has failed to fully understand. And, that, and, and, and here's what Moses knows in this moment, that Pharaoh and Egypt have failed to fully understand. And it is this. Pharaoh and Egypt have every advantage but God. Moses and Israel have no advantage but God. And it's all that they need in order to be victorious. And it's that one missing piece for Pharaoh that will lead to their defeat. Moses gives Israel something even more spectacular than they could have ever imagined. He says in verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Israel's battle with Egypt isn't one in which they even have to fight. The salvation of the Lord has arrived, but it is not a salvation that they have to earn. What is their responsibility in this salvation? Fear not. Stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord. Be silent. Translation, trust me. Trust me. This is a beautiful picture of our own salvation, saints. Over and over and over again, we try to cross the sea in our own strength, in our own energy, with our own efforts. Over and over and over again, we're trying to earn our way into God's favor. Over and over and over again, we're trying to part the seas of eternity on our own. And yet, here's God speaking to Israel and simply saying, fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, be silent, trust me, trust me. 
Saints, this is our salvation. That we simply trust God. That in the midst of things growing difficult and in the midst of the temptation to turn back towards bondage again, that we instead would keep our eyes fixed on the giver of our salvation, that we would instead keep our eyes fixed on the deliverer of our souls, and that we would simply trust him, trust him. And in this moment, they listen to Moses. And as they listen to Moses, in verse 21, it says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. The scripture says that literally a wall of water was erected on both sides. In other words, this wasn't just a moment where they walked through, they happened to find a shallow place in the body of water. No, this was indeed a, a miracle at, on display where two walls were erected, water on both sides, and dry land in between. And they walked across with not a drop on them. Why? Because our God is powerful enough to save. Our God is powerful enough to deliver. You know, if, if our God is powerful enough to save them, isn't he powerful enough to save you? In your moments of doubt, when you wonder and you ask yourself, Lord, am I saved? I'm trying, God. But sometimes I'm failing, not nearly as good as I ought to be. Am I saved? Brothers and sisters, if he erects walls of water to lead his people across dry land, even a people who doubted him. Because there is, no, there is no discussion in this text about who had great faith as they walked across the water and who was still looking at the wall of water as they walked by like, man, I hope this don't fall down on us. There's no discussion about that. There's just a God who is saving despite the people. If he'll save them despite, of, despite them, do you not think he'll save you despite you? We serve a God who will save. We serve a God who will deliver. What does this lead to in closing? After the Lord delivers Egypt with a mighty hand, the walls are erected. Israel marches across dry land. Pharaoh and, and his army in a crave for comfort, looking to bring them back to captivity, says, let's go after them. God obstructs them. And then as they are stuck in the land, the waters then come back on top of them, drowning all of them. What does this lead to when God delivers with a mighty hand? It leads to a song of praise. Chapter 15 is a song of praise. Well, for the sake of time, we won't read it all, but I will read a few verses. It says this, the Lord is my strength, verse 2, and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Verse 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. You see what deliverance brought? Deliverance brought praise. Because they realized that had not God intervened, as they traveled the alternate route, they would have been destroyed. They realized that without God, it was impossible. You see, this is, this is what salvation should produce in all of us. It should produce a song of praise because we, we, we come to realize that apart from Christ, 
Salvation is not possible apart from Christ. Deliverance is not possible apart from Christ. Eternal life is not possible. So to what end is God bringing salvation through Christ? To the end that he might be glorified. To the end that he might be exalted. To the end that he might be praised and lifted up. This is why he brings us through the trials. This is why he takes us down the alternate paths. This is why he carves out a plan of salvation that we in no way could obtain on our own. So that we might give him praise. Both in this life and in the eternal life to come. Let's pray.